Happy Sabbath. Welcome to the Longview Heights Seven Day Adventist Virtual Worship Service. We are glad that you decided to worship with us today. We have a full experience waiting for you with music, prayer, a word from our high, and an emphasis on Black History Month. Please call up a friend or family member and invite them. We hope you enjoy our service. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to wake up this morning and allowing us to be able to move around and be sort of active in, as we are uh, in our homes this morning, Lord. Lord, we are, we're praying for our, we want to pray for our brothers and sisters uh, this morning across the Great Plains and down in the South and other areas that have been affected by the snowstorm this week, Lord. You know, reading about it uh, throughout the week, and 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 just and just understanding their trauma, Lord, of not having power and not being able to put food on the table because you know grocery stores are either closed or the roadways are so bad that you know they can't even get out and go to those stores, and you know not being able to have heat to to combat the cold lord we just we we want we, we're praying for a protection over their lives lord and everything that they're going through right now lord we we continue to ask for protection as we are still dealing with covid lord as 
as every day it seems like a different strand of the virus seems to seems to make a turn uh we pray for protection and pray for healing from this virus as we as a lot of people have gotten over it but they're still still having the remnants of that virus uh having to having to deal with the remnants of that virus lord so pray for protection over covid we want to pray for our leaders uh not only our world leaders our president uh, and the different leaderships around the world but also we want to pray for our leadership uh in our church lord um continue to guide us continue to guide them as well as they're leading uh leading your sheep in the right direction and lord also please forgive us for our sins and our transgressions in jesus name i pray amen
wear the mask that grins and lies. It shades our cheeks and hides our eyes. This debt we paid to human guile with torn and bleeding hearts and smile and mouth with myriad subtleties. Why should the world be overwise in counting all our tears and sighs? Now, and let them only see us while we wear the mask. We smile, but oh my God, our tears to thee from tortured souls arise. And we sing, but oh, the clay is vile beneath our feet and long the mouth. But let the world think otherwise, we wear the mask. When I think about myself, I almost laugh myself to death. My life has been one great big joke, a dance that's walked, a song was spoke. I laugh so hard I almost choke when I think about myself. Seventy years in these folks' world, the child I work for calls me girl. I say yes, ma'am, for working's sake. I'm too proud to be in and too poor to break. So I laugh until my stomach aches when I think about myself. My folks can make me split my side. I laugh so hard, I nearly die. The tales they tell sound just like lying. They grow the fruit, but eat the rind. I laugh until I start to crying when I think about myself and my folks and the little children. My father sits on benches, their flesh counts every plank. The slats have leave dents of darkness deep in their withered flank. And they nod like broken candles, all waxed and burnt profound. They say, but sugar, it was our submission that made your world go round. There in those fleeted faces, I see the ocean, auction block the chains and slavery's coffle, the whip and lash and stock. My father's speaking voices, they shred my fact and sound. They say, but sugar, it was our submission that made your world go round. They laugh to shield their crying. They shuffle through their dreams. They step and fetch a country and wrote the blues and strings. I understand their meaning. It could and did derive from living on the ledge of death. They kept my race alive by wearing the mask. It is offering time a time where we are able to test our faith through the giving of tithes. God requires for us only to give 10% of your income. After all, everything belongs to him. He allow us to keep 90%. He will promise to give us so many blessings we will not be able to receive them. To test God at, at his promise, you may give your tithes and offering to any of the ways listed on the screen.
shall we pray? Thank you, thank you God for all you give us. Give us the strength to always trust you and give to you first. I pray you will bless us abundantly. Bless these offerings to be used for your rape. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry out in the sun? Or does it fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or does it crust and sugar over like a, um, a syrupy sweet? Maybe it sags. 
like a heavy load? Or does it explode? Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is, Never mind. it's not that important. I figured we should take some time for you to get to know me better. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is, Never mind. it's not that important. I thought, since we share this country, we should learn to work together. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is, never mind, it's not that important. How is me walking home from the store to you being suspicious? Hey, what's up, what's up? Never mind, it's not that important. Not only did you kill me, but then you were acquitted. Hey, what's up, what's up? Never mind, it's not that important. Um, yes, officer, I'm armed, but I'm just reaching for my license. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is Never Mind, it's not that important. Shot five times, and then the killer was acquitted, but hey, we love our Second Amendment. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is Never Mind, it's not that important. I turn on my evening news and I'm shocked by what I see. Hey, what's up, what's up? Never mind, it's not important. A man begging for his life, saying, officer, I can't breathe. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is Never Mind, it's not important. Yeah, I spoke to that white woman, but I didn't offend anybody, man. You tripping. Hey, what's up? What's up? My name is Never Mind. It's not that important. Kidnapped, beaten, and murdered. And of course, the killers were acquitted. I am so tired with this burden that I carry, but I have to maintain composure because angry black man is scary. Why are we putting up with the same stuff from a hundred years ago? But hey, that's just the musings of your ordinary average Joe. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is, Never mind. it's not important. God made me what I am. We're all children of the most high. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is, never mind, it's not that important. I love you, but you seem to hate me, and I have to wonder why. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is, never mind, it's not important. We're all children of the king, so when you look at me, don't be frightened. Hey, what's up, what's up? My name is, never mind, it's, not that important. I'll state it here one day. I hope we will actually be united. Peace out. Take care. I love you.
Good morning, saints of the Most High God. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. You can't even imagine all of the wonderful things, the great things that God has bestowed in your life. Every now and then, we ought to just thank him for being so good to us. I want to give honor to God for being the head of my life, leading me and keeping me, making sure that whatever comes my way that he's already tested so that I can bear whatever the trial might be. We serve a gracious God. We serve a mighty God. We serve a holy God. And the Holy Spirit has preempted us. Sometimes we think we have all the technology, but the Holy Spirit is ahead of our te technological thinking. He's ahead of all the things that we have. The Holy Spirit has been here before we can even imagine. In fact, Jesus, God said that the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the waters at creation. So the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding in our worship service today, and I'm thankful for that. There is a word from the Lord, and I'd like to share it with you today, but before we open up the word, let's bow our heads in prayer. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, Thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to the book of Acts. Chapter 8, verse 26 through 28. Acts, the eighth chapter, starting with verse 26. And I'm reading from the New King James. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. The message today is entitled, Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. Ahmaud Arbery, Brianna Taylor, George Floyd, recently, Jacob Blake. If we would go back into history, we could call the name of Emmett Till way back in 1955. Or if we'd go back to the first black slave that came upon this continent in 1619, that was trafficked here in the United States. God knows their names. He knows everything about them. Man may have forgotten, but God knows them. He knows that black people have endured trying to sing the Lord's song in a strange land. They are the ones who endured, endured racism, nationalism, state-sponsored murder, vigilante violence. They are the ones who endure. They endure delayed justice, massive incarceration, which is slavery by another name. 
housing discrimination, health care disparities, and a non-living wage, food swamps in their community. A president, our presidential dog whistles like very fine people on both sides. They are the ones who endure. God has not forgotten them. They have not, not been blanked out of his history book. He has given us a word today. And I like to read it again, found in the book of Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 26 through 28. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. This pericope is full of truth that we must understand and we must put into our own minds as, as how God is leading black people, how God is working even among people of color, how God understands that black lives really do matter. I'd like to give you four points really quickly. First of all, the Ethiopian's purpose. Secondly, the Ethiopian's position. Thirdly, the Ethiopian's preparation. And fourthly, the Ethiopian's providence. Uh, this black man felt the need of worship. The distance between Ethiopia and Jerusalem is 4,197 kilometers, or 1,550 miles. If you were on a horse, if you rode as fast as you could, it would take you 14 hours switching horses like the Pony Express. It would take you 14 hours to travel just 100 miles. To travel 1,550 miles, this chariot would have had to take more than two weeks to make such a journey. When is the last time you travel like that to worship? <laughs> he had a desire to worship. He, he spent his vacation to go to worship. This black man was motivated to worship. That was his purpose. That was the reason why he was there. Worship is a sacrifice. Worship costs you something. David said in 2 Samuel 24, 24, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. Whenever you decide to worship, worship is a sacrifice. Worship is something that you have to give. It's not just something that you receive. It's not just praising God and saying thank you. Worship is when you give something to God. You can't worship God without it costing you something. It's got to cost you some time. It's got to cost you your talents. It's got to cost you your whole body. Worship has the cost, and only when it costs is it meaningful. Free worship that, that has no, no, where the worshiper gives nothing is not really worship at all. Real worship has to cost you something. I mean more than just financial. It has to cost your life. Real worship is a sacrifice. Real worship is a faith move. I like the story of the Syrophoenician woman that wanted her daughter that had a demon to be healed. And she interceded with, for her daughter. She went to Jesus and, and she said, 
then, then she came and worshipped him saying, Lord, help me. The disciples tried to push her away, but she loved Jesus so much that she was willing to take the crumbs from the master's table. Jesus, listening to her, faith said, Oh, woman, your faith is great. Be it unto you, even as thou wilt. God honors faith in worship. Real worship is a faith move. You can't worship God without faith. You have to understand that you can't figure him out. He's beyond our understanding. And when we worship him, we worship him knowing that he's going to work it out, even though we can't see how he's going to work it out. When we worship him, we call him to do some great things that we can't even imagine because we have faith in him. We know if we just wait on the Lord that we will be of a good courage and he will strengthen our hearts. Why? Because our faith is in God. Faith, worship is a faith move. Worship is a God experience. It's a God experience. It's, it is time that you spend with your creator. Uh, it, it, it is different from you and somebody else. Maybe from your culture and somebody else's culture. You can't say one is right and one is wrong. Worship is too big for us to put into a box. It, it goes beyond our understanding. It can be objective or subjective. It can be transformational or evangelistic. Worship can be spontaneous or organized. Haven't you ever just wanted to praise God? You didn't plan it. Maybe you were in your car and you thought about God's goodness in your life and you tried to keep one hand on the wheel and just wave another hand. It was spontaneous because God is so good to you that you have to praise him. Worship is contemporary and it's traditional. Uh, there is not one form that you can say this is the only way. Worship is sorrowful and it's celebratory. Uh, worship has all sorts of different facets to it. But the purpose that this black man had that went to Jerusalem was to worship the true and living God. Uh, he believed in God. When you worship, then you are one of the ones that endure. See, Satan's strategy is to threaten your worship. He wants people to, 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 to have excuses why they can't worship. One of the things I like about this time that we live in, when we have to talk to each other on Zoom or, or, or Facebook or YouTube, is that everybody can come to worship. You, you don't have to worry about how you look. I wish somebody would pray with me today. You don't have to worry about, uh, even if you're on time, you can worship God just the way you are. There are no excuses for worship now. Even if that sister in the church that makes you mad, you don't even have to see her. You can worship God anyway. Hallelujah. The good news is that we can worship God even in difficult times. But right now, even though Satan wants to stop you from coming to worship, you have to worship God just the way you are. Uh, I think that black man, uh, that Ethiopian, I think that he read over there in Psalms where the Bible says, Psalms 34, verse 1 and 3, I will bless the Lord at all times. Hallelujah. I got to stop right there. You know, it's, it's easy to bless the Lord when, when there's food on the table. Uh, but he, he said, I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. Uh, it's easy to bless the Lord when everything is going peachy cream. But I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. There is an experience 
for worshiping God. It's a God experience. It changes who you are. And even in the depths of your depression, when you worship God, somehow God is able to lift you up. I wish someone was praying with me today. There, there is a power in just worshiping God. This Ethiopian's purpose was to worship God. Today, I hope that you have a purpose to worship God. The Ethiopian had a position. He had a position. This black man had great authority. He was a CFO of Ethiopia. <laughs> he, you, you, know, you, know, you know he was hated. You know people didn't like him. Anytime a black man is in a high position, somebody don't like it. Um, you know he was profiled. They probably saw him and said, um, where did he get that chariot from? That don't, that don't look like a chariot. He should be having it. He probably stole the chariot. And, and they were looking at him and, 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 and what was he wearing? And, and, and why, was he, why did he have so much jewelry on? Help me, Holy Ghost. Why, why did he look the way he looked? And, and he must not be a seven-day Adventist. And, and, and he must not be a part of our conference. Uh, he, he thinks he's better than we are because he's from Africa. It's so easy for us to judge people and to, to talk about them. But even when people talk about you, it is because God has given you a position. God is teaching black people there ain't nothing wrong with having a position of authority. Uh, God will give you those positions, but once you get it, I want you to realize that some of the people that you think were your very friends will be the ones who will try to take you out. Anytime you have a position of authority, sometimes it can be a dangerous thing because people don't like you sometimes when you lead. Help me, Holy Ghost. Uh, positions of authority are given by God. I want to tell every young person in this, this place, every person watching, that God wants you to have positions of authority. Let me quote a, quote a white girl. <laughs> ministry, excuse me, message of, to young people, page 36. She says in message to young people, page 36, Dear youth, what is the aim and purpose of your life? Are you ambitious for education? That you may have, that you may have a name and position, 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 in the world, have you thoughts that you dare not express that you may one day stand upon the summit of intellectual greatness, that you may sit in the deliberative and legislative councils and help enact laws for the nation? There is nothing wrong with these aspirations. You may, every one of you, make your mark. You should be content with no mean attainments. Aim high and spare no pain to reach the standard. Um, the emphasis is mine. Uh, she's basically saying that God wants you to do your best. God wants you to, to be a great leader. This black man was a leader. I don't know how old he was. I, I don't know his, his age, but there are some things I know about him. First of all, I know he was a baller. Uh, I know that he, he, he had all sorts of things going on in his life. He, he was a boss. He was in charge. This man was good in math. Help me, Holy Ghost. He, he knew about math. He, he had advanced education. This was not a broke man. He had an entourage. He was not just driving his chariot, but there were others around him. He had security guards. He had people around him. Black Queen Candace was his friend. This man was an awesome guy. God positioned this black man because black lives matter to God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Before you get a little upset because you're not a CFO, uh, before you get discouraged because you're not the head of the company. You know, God cares about every position that you have. 
regardless of how high it is or how low it is. It doesn't matter where you work, as long as you do the best job you can do. Wherever you are assigned, wherever God has given you the ability to serve, serve your best at wherever you are. Amen. Do your best. Uh, let me get a quote from, 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 from Martin Luther King Jr. He says, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven will pause to say, here lies a great street sweeper who did his job well. Whatever job God has given you to do, whatever position you're in, it's not a lowly position. It's position that God has given you. This Ethiopian had a position. Positions require diligence, intentionality, and perseverance. If you really want to have a position, then you're going to have to have diligence. You're going to make sure that you are doing the things that you, some simple things like be on time. Help me, Holy Ghost. Be on, be on you know, some simple things like making sure that everything that you do, that you checked it and, and made sure it's right. You need to have some intentionality. You need to be deliberate. It needs to be something that you work at really hard, that you are, you are proud of your craft. And then you need to have perseverance because whenever you have a position, there's going to be some difficult days. There's going to be some heartaches and there's going to be some setbacks and detours. And on your position, you have to have perseverance in your position. Listen, no one's really going to give it to you. You've got to take it for yourself. No one's just going to hand it out to you. you the, the positions that you have, you have to work for them. This Ethiopian had a position and he was one that endured. He endured the people that wanted to stop him. He endured the people that didn't like him because of who he was. Maybe they didn't like his mama. Or maybe they didn't like the way he looked. Maybe they thought that he was not the right person for the job. But he kept on working. He didn't quit when people told him that he was not going to make it. Quitting, ladies and gentlemen, is not an option. You may have failed, but you're not a failure because you failed. Everybody listening to me today has experienced failure. And some of our failures are huge. But at the same time, you are not a failure unless you believe you are a failure. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16, a righteous man may fall seven times, but rises up again. I don't know about you, but I've had some serious failures. I've had some issues where, where I realized that God alone could get me through it. I've had some failures that I realized are my own making. But the same God that has brought me in the past, I know that he'll take me for today. And wherever you are, whatever position you're in, know that God has okayed your position. God has stamped his approval on your position. And God cares about you even in the position you had. This Ethiopian had a position. He was in charge of Queen Candace's money. Um, this Ethiopian understood preparation. It's in the text. Acts chapter 8, verse 28. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. This black man was prepared by the passage that we call the suffering servant. And he was a little confused because he wondered who was the master and who was the servant. He was being prepared by the word of God. He was trying to understand it. This black man had left Jerusalem. He was on his way back home. And all the time he was in Jerusalem, 
<clears throat> Nobody told him about Jesus. Although just a few days before, Jesus had, had died on the cross and, and had rose from the grave. Just a few days before, all the miracles that he had happened, this, this Ethiopian didn't see these things. And on his way home, <clears throat> he was trying to figure out who Jesus was. He didn't know. You know what? You can be around a lot of religious people and not know Jesus. You can be around church folk and not know Jesus for yourself. You can be called a Seventh-day Adventist, but not know Jesus. Jesus is something, Jesus is a person that you have to know for yourself. This black man had endured humiliation by the mere fact that he was not a Jew. By the mere fact that somehow his life was altered because he was a eunuch. Um, all these things were against him. By the mere fact of all this humiliation, he needed Jesus more than ever before. But he didn't know Jesus. This man had a sin problem because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And his, his sin problem was in his life, but he didn't know Jesus. And it was Philip's job to preach Jesus to him. Hallelujah. Philip preached about the Messiah, the one hoped for, the one that they were waiting for, the one that was going to come and change their salvific history. He was the one that was the Lamb of God that took away the sins of the world. Philip preached the mission of the Messiah. He let him know, he let this black man know that Jesus came to live an example for us to be baptized, to show that we need to be baptized, to walk and talk and, and to live a Christ-centered life. He showed him about the Sabbath. He showed him about how you can love one another. He showed this man about how important it is to understand we're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. Knowing him is, makes the difference in your life. He understood the vicarious sacrifice of Jesus and while they were in the chariot together, this, this, this black man was having an education about Jesus. He was learning about him for the first time. He learned about the ministry of Christ. His intercessor, he's the intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary. He understood that if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. He stands in our place. He loves us so much that whatever we go through, he's always by our side. In fact, he has the Holy Spirit that walks with us and keeps us. And when we turn to the left or to the right, we'll hear a voice that says, this is the way. Walk ye in it. This, this man... This black man was learning of the intercessory power of the ministry of Christ. This, this, this black man was learning through Philip about Maranatha. One day Jesus was going to come again. He, he, he was learning that, that this same Jesus that, that, that was on the, the Mount of Olives, this, this same Jesus that rose up from the Mount of Olives shall return the same way he left. And every eye is going to see him. This man was taught Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what we got to teach today. We've got to teach and we've got to preach Jesus. This preparation is what happens when you decide to be an endurer. Uh, this, this is, he became the one who endures. Listen, listen. We have a lot to endure in this country, in this land. Uh, it will not get better for Black Lives Matter in America. America is not going to be converted and all of a sudden everybody's going to love one another. Systematic racism will not change regardless of who is the president. Oh, wait a minute now. Make sure you vote. Amen. Get into some good trouble and, and vote regardless of, 
of, of, of, of the situation, you still have to vote. But I want you to know that we can't solve the climate change. We can't fix the racism. We can't, we can't give enough power to people so that they will start loving one another. We don't have the ability to do it. Systemic racism will still be here. Philip had to tell this man the words of Jesus. Philip had to explain God's words. Philip had to record in this man's mind what Jesus said. Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulations. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Philip told him, Clearly, let not your heart be troubled. I, I know you're going back to, 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 to Ethiopia. I, I know people are going to talk about you when you tell them about this new faith that you have. But let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house. Hallelujah. Our many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. Oh, Philip had to put some hope in this black man's heart to let him know that God is still in charge. Philip had to tell him what Jesus said. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in all, both in Judea and in all Samaria and in Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. God wants to put some hope in our lives. He wants to prepare us. He wants to uh, let us know that there is a way to prepare so that we can be the people that endure. I want you to know that we've got some trouble ahead. Regardless of what you hear on the news, regardless of how beautiful somebody may paint the picture, uh, the Bible lets me know that this earth is headed for a time of trouble. And men and women all over this world need to be ready. And the way that we prepare ourselves is study the word of God. Is to put the word of God in our hearts. David said, how with it, or how be it shall a young man, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed to the word. Thy word have I hid in my heart. This man's preparation to know the truth starts always with the word of God. Listen, if you want to know the truth, go to the Bible. Go to the source. Read it for yourself. This man was prepared from the word of God. And lastly, my favorite part, the Ethiopian saw God's providence. He saw God's providence. Black lives matter to God. He was, he was on his way home. Um, he, he, he probably didn't have a whole lot of people that became his friends in Jerusalem. Probably didn't have a whole lot of people that were willing to open up and share themselves with him. And, 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 and it would have been difficult because people, just because looking at him, they didn't like him. Because uh, some people are prejudiced just by looking at black people. Ah, uh, but an angel of the Lord was sent. The Lord knew this Ethiopian. He knew his travels. He knew his schedule. He knew his direction and how he was getting home. And at the right time, he told Philip, I want you to go to the south. I want you to go to the desert. I want you to go to the desert, Philip. Uh, Philip, there's something. He didn't tell him what he was going to do. There's something in the desert that I have for you to do. God is very providential. His, his, his benevolent will sends us places and we don't understand it. God sets you up in his providence. God will send you to a desert, but he will not tell you why. God will send you to a desert, but he will not tell you how long you're supposed to stay there. God will send you to a desert 
and it will be uncomfortable. No one wants to go to a desert. Deserts are not our choice to live. We want to live in a beautiful, palatial place. We want to live where there's great rainfall, where there's temperate weather. We don't want to live in a desert. But God is not concerned with what you want. He's trying to save you. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55 and verse 9. God's ways are past finding out. Every now and then, his providence will take you to a desert. A place where there's very little rainfall. A place where things are dying. A place where it's uncomfortable. Deserts are God's distant learning platforms. That's where he's able to teach. If you ask Moses, he would say, I learned about God in the desert. Uh, it, it's in a desert place where, where God pulls you aside and, and no one else can be there. And he works with you and teaches you in the desert because you got to lean on him in the desert. You can't make it by yourself in the desert. You'll need help. You, you, you'll need dependence upon him in a desert. And God has a platform for, for, for learning, and it's always in a desert, in a place where he takes you away from the regular population. Takes you away from all the clatter and all the commercials. He gives you a spot all by yourself, and you don't know, what, you don't know why he's doing it, but he's trying to save you. Deserts are God's rehabilitation facilities. God will take you because of the habits that we have, because of the, 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 the way that we think, because of the depression that's in our lives. He'll take us to a desert. Ah, that's what I like. He, he left some deserts on the earth so that, that when people get into trouble, he can hide them in a desert and hold them and keep them and rehabilitate them in the desert. That's what God does. He, he works with you while you can't figure out any way on your own. But he's able to rehabilitate you. He's able to give you therapy in the desert. That's, that's why he gives you a desert. Deserts are where God's providence provide water. Oh, I like that. There's not very much water in the desert. When Philip was talking to this man and share with him the truth, just as God provided Philip for this man, God provided water for baptism. God is awesome providing. He's a, he's a providential God. He does things we can't understand it, but God can bring water in the desert. That's what I like about him. The water, he owns the desert. He owns the water. And if he wants to, he can make a river in the desert. Ah, this black man could not see the providence of God until he was in a desert. Have you ever been in a desert? A desert could be in a hospital room. Not long ago, I suffered some heart problems. In that hospital room, I was in a desert. All the people were around me, but really I felt all by myself. I, I felt so alone because, because I realized how fragile your life is. How you don't have to be here tomorrow. And, and in that hospital room with all the different things going on, I realized that if it wasn't for the hand of God, I wouldn't be alive today. God places you in a desert. Desert could be when you can't sleep at night because of the financial problems you have to think about, because of the problems in your life that you haven't been able to get the victory over, because of the issues with your husband or with your wife or with your children, and you can't find any sleep at night, and you're up walking the halls of your home, or your eyes are wide awake, and you can't sleep because you're in a desert. Deserts are places where you don't know what to do. You, you have no answer. Deserts are when you've messed up again. You promised God you wasn't going to do it. 
You said, Lord, I, I'm not going to make this mistake again. I'm going to be true to you. But you got right back in the mess that you got out of. And it's still stinky on you. And, and the guilt is there. And you feel bad because you're in a desert. In a desert of guilt, a desert of shame, a desert of, I'm not going to make it. I, I can't stop doing this particular thing. Before I know it, I'm doing it again. And the desert is so con 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 controlling in your life. And sometimes you get depressed in a desert. Sometimes you feel like there's no way to get some water. There's no way to get any victory. Sometimes in the desert, You'll be ready to give up. You'll be ready to say, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to find my way out of this desert. In fact, sometimes in a desert, like Elijah, you'll say, Lord, just take my life. Uh, I can't handle it anymore. The desert is too much. Maybe you are in a desert. Maybe your life is so messed up that a desert is all around you and that desert is all around you and you're asking God why am I in the desert God has you in the desert because of his providence is in the desert he has you right where he wants you he has you in a situation where you have to trust him regardless of what's around you. In a desert, it's where God wants to save you. And when he brings you out of the desert, you're going to have a testimony. You're going to be able to raise your hand and you're going to say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. You're going to be able to praise him throughout your life because of the desert experience that you're in. Listen, the ones who endure go through a desert. And as scripture text today, Philip met him in the desert. God sends somebody to help you in the desert. He's so much God that he knows the way that you're going. He loves you and he loves you so much that he will not let you die in the desert if you just trust him. If you call on his name, if you say, Lord, I need you now. I need your help. Even in the deserts, you will have the power to endure in the desert. Trust God. That's what I'm trying to say today. Trust God in the deserts of life. Trust God when you don't know the way you should go. Trust God when you feel like giving up. Trust God when you have no more power on your own. Trust him. I guarantee you he's going to come through. He's going to come through. He's going to make it work for you. Listen, listen. Maybe you're in the desert and you need some help. I want to let you know that God is willing to help you. He's willing to help you. He's willing and he's able. He'll carry you through. He'll be water in the desert. He'll give you sustenance and he'll give you a way to survive in the desert of your life. When you trust him, when you trust him, he always makes a way. In fact, he has a thousand ways that we don't even know about. So today, whatever desert you're in, Know that God has given you a purpose. Know that God has given you a position. Be clear that God has prepared you for this desert and his providence is leading you. You ought to say thank you, Jesus, for my desert. Thank you, God, because it's only in the desert where you perfect my character. Only in the desert or you give me a message to give to somebody else and to be able to praise your name. Today, maybe you'd like to make a decision to follow God, even in your desert. Today, 
Maybe you'd like to say, I want to follow Jesus. Maybe you want to be baptized. Maybe you want to start all over with God. Maybe you want to say, yes, God, I, I want to give you my complete life. I, I know I'm in a desert, but I know you can make water in the desert. And so, so I want you to change my life and, and help me to start over. God will meet you in the desert. Maybe you're so depressed right now, you, you don't even know what to say. Just, just raise your hand and say, Lord, I need you. I need you right now, Lord. Maybe you're going through something and, 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 and we don't know and can't help you. But there is a friend. In fact, there's nobody else like the lowly Jesus. Nobody's like him. And if you call on him, he'll answer your every call. Right now, watch his providential workings in the deserts of your life. Trust him. Today, I want to pray for you. As you are in the desert, I want you to know the same God that was with this black man is with you. And he has a plan for your life. His providence has led you into where you are today. And he's willing, his benevolent will will take you where he wants you to go. Trust God. Trust God in the desert. Father, Lord in heaven, we're thankful for your word today. We pray that you constantly give us the assurance that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That you're always by our side. In fact, before we call, you will answer. Put your arm around somebody today, God. Somebody is in a desert. I, I don't know what desert they may be in, but you know all about it. Bring them home. You're the only one that knows the way. You, you know the way through the desert. All we have to do is follow. We just follow you and you take us where we need to go. Be with that discouraged person. That wandering person. That phony and fake person. Let the desert have a character development effect upon our lives that we will be covered by your righteousness. And we'll be able to sing a song even in the desert. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. May God bless you today.
Before we end our service, I'd like to share with you our mission and vision statements. Our mission statement is reflecting Christ by connecting, helping, reaching, inspiring, serving, and teaching. Our vision statement is at Longview Heights SDA Church, we seek to connect all souls with the Holy Spirit, help the weak, reach the lost, inspire humanity, serve our community, and teach God's word. I want to invite you and all of your friends to be a part of our Friendship Bible class. In our health study, you will learn how to feel better, look younger, live longer, lose weight, feel great, and improve the quality of your life while making new friends. In our amazing Bible facts study, you will learn how to add years to your life. What happens when you die? Can you die before your time? Can your loved ones come back from the grave and talk to you? In our church history and Bible prophecy study, you will understand the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, about the coming of the seven last plagues, when water will be turned to blood, when painful and grievous sores will come on all those who receive the mark of the beast. Who gets the mark of the beast, the number 666? If you call and enroll in our friendship class within the next 60 seconds, you will receive a special gift for being one of the first to call. Call us now, 901-235-2033. That number once again, 901-235-2033. 901 901- 235-2033. It's free. Please pray with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us the chance to worship with you again. Thank you for protecting us throughout this global pandemic. And please continue to protect us and give us peace and understanding. Please help us to be more like you and forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you would like prayer, Bible study, or to become a member, please text the phrase on the screen to the number on the screen. For future references, our address is 685 East Mallory, and our phone number is 901-774-5431. Thank you for joining our worship service today. We hope you enjoyed it, and we can't wait to see you next week.